You are listening to Jerry Royce Live Worldwide Podcast. Rock with Zion on Rock Life Live. It's a love thing. You are listening to Jerry Royce Live Worldwide Podcast. Rock with me, rock with me, fam. How's everyone out there? Thank you for rocking with me here, Rock Life um, Live. And I am so excited that you are here on Positive Power Radio Double XI with Jerry Royce and I. Of course, this is the third day of the six. We have our guest, special guest, Eric. E. Robinson, Minister Eric E. Robinson, to say, and we're talking about all about sex. Mm-hmm. If you are with us on the other two episodes, um, very, very dynamic speaking of what the word sex is all about and how it's not listed not one single time in the Bible. Anyway, we have something special waiting for you coming up, so I want you to go ahead, invite your friends. Go ahead, fight family. Let's get together. Let's talk about it and be about what's really God expecting us from this three-letter word or was he not expecting anything at all because really it was something that was man-made that will go again and oppose the word of God. All right, so go ahead and invite everyone. And for now, uh, we're going to listen to Felicia Joseph with Just For Me. All God's people come together and send this praise up Way in the beginning before time began God knew it would be A man the same man Someone sinless, someone blameless To pay the price for my forgiveness With no doubt or no hesitation Jesus died to save the nation He bled, he died, his sacrifice Give me a right to the tree of life
don't want to miss this, folks. Carlson McConnell and Round the Clock Entertainment, in association with Tag Entertainment and the nationally syndicated radio show, The New Artist Profile, present the Rhythm of Gospel Awards Hall of Fame Indie Artist Showcase, June 22nd, 2018, beginning at 10.30 a.m. at the luxurious Hilton Hotel, 45 West Orchard Park Drive, Greenville, South Carolina. This event is open to independent gospel recording artists looking to expand and expose your music ministry. With a who's who list of radio, media, and industry professionals in attendance, this is definitely the event you will want to be a part of. We will also be celebrating the induction of CEO Carlton McConnell into the Rhythm of Gospel Hall of Fame for over 35 years of service in the gospel music industry. This event will be hosted by none other than Tony D on the radio, host of the New Artist Profile, award-winning syndicated radio broadcast. For more information, email Round the Clock Entertainment at roundtheclock.cm at gmail.com or phone 927-834-5936. We want to see you there. Welcome to my journey right here on Music Vision Television. We are all a result of our life journeys. You can say to yourself, the sum of who I am is a result of my journey. Each episode will guide, inspire, and encourage you through your own personal journey as members of the independent artist industry. Sit down to share how they are making it through life's challenges. Join us on my journey with Paula G. right here on Music Vision Television. Stacy Young Productions. You are the reason that I see. That you bring, and you are the lover of my soul. You hold me close and never let me go. When I'm in trouble, it's you who rescues me. I'm never without love. Wanted to give up, but you wouldn't let me. I failed you many times, but you never failed me. I missed many marks, but your grace kept me. This love that you've shown and this joy that I have, the world did not give it, the world cannot take it away. Your resurrection power made me brand new. I'm no longer about to sin, I'm forever intertwined with you. My past is gone, I'm a new creature in you. You did it all for me and you saved me. <laughs> you did it all for me because you love me. You love me. I love you too. Your name is Jesus. Uh, you intercede for me.
All praises to the Most High. Thank you for rocking with us. I hear up here, Eric Robinson. Um, Eric, how are you? Okay, maybe we have some difficulties here. We're going to go ahead and play another song until we can get the connection straight. All right, hold on tight with us because we have a great show ahead of us. You are listening to Jewish Live Worldwide Podcast. Hi, I'm Nina Taylor, and here is your gospel news. Worship leader, recording artist, songwriter, and producer Israel Holton became involved full-time in worship ministry in 1989. From the start, he looked to overcome cultural and denominational barriers. With this idea in mind, Israel formed New Breed Ministries in 1995. It was a group of world-class musicians and singers. Touring extensively brought the ministry's powerful and diverse sound to churches around around the U.S. While Israel's two 1997 releases, Whisper It Loud and Way of the World, kicked off his recording career. New season from 2001, Real in 2002, then Live from Another Level in 2004, Alive in South Africa 2005, which featured a performance in Cape Town, South Africa in front of 8,000 people. The London Sessions was his album in 2010, then Houghton and his group continued to document their travels around the world with the successful covered Alive in Asia released in 2015. Isabel Davis, pastor and contemporary Christian recording artist out of New Orleans, Louisiana, born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. She started her singing career as a toddler. A few years later, she became the center's worship pastor. She and her husband moved to New Orleans, where she joined City of Love. Within five years, she was named the church's worship pastor. And it was around that time she released her successful single, The Call. Isabel Davis voted this year New Artist of the Year by the Stellar Gospel Music Awards. Oprah Winfrey Network announced the second season of their hit docuseries, Black Love, is coming back this May. The series highlights love stories from the black community. It debuted last fall to 1.2 million viewers around the world, becoming OWN's most watched unscripted series debut in the network history. What is a boycott? It's defined as an act of voluntary and intentional abstention from using, buying, or dealing with a person, organization, or country as an expression of protest, usually for social, political, or environmental reasons. Some Sometimes a boycott can be formed from consumer activism, sometimes called moral purchasing. Basically, the way I put it, don't go, don't use, and don't buy. In 1953, the Baton Rouge boycott occurred. This was the first black bus boycott in America. That summer, the African American community of Baton Rouge set the tone of the modern civil rights movement years before the Supreme Court's landmark round versus the Board of Education. And the significant protests of the Montgomery bus boycott led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks, leaders of the Baton Rouge black community, stood up for racial equality. In March of 1953, black leaders in Baton Rouge were successful in having city council pass Ordinance 222, which permitted for blacks to be seated on any public transportation on a first-come, first-served basis. Boycott against the company Safeway until it employed African Americans. That was in 1941. One of the earliest examples was a boycott in England of the sugar produced by slaves. In 1791, after Parliament refused to abolish slavery, thousands of pamphlets were printed encouraging not to buy sugar. Was the boycott successful? Yes, it was. And of course, first there was Joanne Robinson, a civil rights activist, made African Americans aware as they represented 75% of the Montgomery Bus Company's clientele, and she organized the Monday 
boycott whereby all African Americans refused to ride buses. The boycott continued another year. Was it successful? Yes, it was. On December 20th, 1956, laws requiring segregated buses were declared unconstitutional in Montgomery and across the United States. Here's your Billboard Top 10 Gospel Songs in the Country. Number 10, Ernest Pugh survived. Number 9, Travis Green, You Waited. Number 8, Tamala Mann, Through It All, featuring Timberland. Number 7, J.J. Harrison, A Youthful Praise, No Reason to Fear. Number 6, William Murphy, Everlasting God. Number 5, Jermaine Dolly, Serve. Number 4, Ja'Kalen Carr, You Will Win. Number 3, Todd Delaney, Your Great Name. B.B. Winans has the number 2 gospel song this week with He Promised Me. And number 1, once again for 5 weeks, Corinne Hawthorne with Won't He Do It. Well, that's your Billboard Top 10 songs in the country, your definition and examples of successful boycotts, and your gospel news. I'm Nina Taylor. Let's get back to more great gospel music on this great station. Shay. Got plenty of reasons Because they come a dime a dozen He died for me So it's God I'm loving And it's that Holy Spirit in me That's keeping this whole world buzzing Believing in the cross life So it's no more thug It's living proof And it's proof That he raised the dead All right All right Thank you Royal family This is your host Zion Jones Rock Life Live with It's a Love Thing, your three day fix. This is the third day fix with myself and special guest, Minister Eric D. Robinson. Hey, Eric, how are you? I'm well and blessed. How about you? Oh, blessed. I say I'm blessed by the best. Blessed by the best. Yeah, the d- yeah, it almost yeah. seemed like the devil didn't want this work going for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we had some technical difficulties getting on, everyone, so thank you for your patience. But you know what? Um, it's always going it to be delayed, but it cannot be denied. His word will Amen. always come through one way or another. So we've been having a wonderful, wonderful discussion um, by the Spirit of God talking about the word sex and, you know, um, let's talk about sex. And, you know, first first day six, we talked a lot about the spirit of Delilah and her purpose of finding the strength of the man and, and how there's a lot of Delilah spirits, not only in men, but in women as well. You know, goes in both sectors, male and female. And we also um, talked about relationships, um, those who are single last week, which was really good. Um, You want to do a little small summary of that before we go ahead and start on what we're going to talk about today, which um, is very exciting because we're going to talk about, um, of course, sex and, and versus the dead being undefiled. 
what God mentions in, in the in the Bible. So just give them a little brief summary from last week about the singles, and then we we'll go from there. Amen. Basically, what we're talking about the singles is the fact that we're talking about how to we was te- giving it, advice and teaching and using the Word of God to teach the people about how to be willing to stay celibate and what to watch out for when it comes down to being equally on yoke with people. And then when it comes down to their situations, I'm at this end, that in everything we do in knowledge God, including in relationships, including in marriages, because the last thing we don't want to do is be disobedient or have our blessings hindered because of we're pleasing our fleshly needs more than our spiritual needs. And also when it comes also, when we was talking about as well, that this was never mentioned in the Bible, we just call it fornication. So, sex is just basically something the world came up to call it instead of calling it what it was biblically called in the first place before then, which was sex, which is the definition of sex. But at the end of the day, we just was encouraging Giving it, we were just encouraging one another to how to avoid, how to deal with situations, and what to do and what not to do. Right, and we also talked about the war, that war that fights against um, that. That Paul talks about, you know, the things that I would do that I would not do, meaning that we have to be washed in the Word of God. That is the only strength that we have to overcome the flesh. Um, before because truly, God does not tempt us of evil, but we are tempted by our own flesh, by the own lust and temptation of ourselves. Um, so that was just a powerful subject, understanding that, yeah, there is a war. And if you know that you are tempted or, or you're starting to court someone and you are, you know, want to keep yourself or that person to keep themselves in that situation um, so that you can court. Um, asking God if this is the wife that you have brought to me, you know. Um, and when you're having that and you're talking to God, you don't want to put yourself in tempting situations because, of course, then that comes on where that fornication actually can take over. So go ahead and um, I'd like you to share with the audience about uh, like you said, sex was fornication. They changed it, and they used sex, 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 sex. Sex is everywhere, about everything. It's just like almost ruling the earth. You can't watch TV. You can't go down the street. Every billboard you see, everything you do, it seems like it's driving everything to sex. And we read last week how um, it's like the ditch of hell for, you know, for a flattering woman to come on to a man or even a, for a man to deceive a woman you know, for these same things, for sexual favors, as they would call them, but actually trying to get them into the sin of fornication. What would you say is the most important that men and women have to follow so they will not fall into that ditch? One thing they should be willing to always do is listen to that, listen to what God is saying and listen to that spirit. If you've been, if you been living godly, living holy, like we're supposed to consider, it says in the word, be as, be holy as I am holy. And if we're willing, if we're talking about knowing our worth and telling that significant other that I want to be celibate, I want to wait till I am married to be intimate. It's more of a situation of either they really respect that or they don't. And the ones who really respect that matter will respect it. They will respect that God that's in you and not the fact of showing a disrespect because a lot of times we are deceived by what we see and not what we see in the inside of that person, the real intentions. So in order for us to also live right and do it right because it also says the word that we should flee from fornication we talking about when Joseph flee away from Potiphar's, um, Potiphar's wife because she was trying to seduce so Joseph and in order so he ran away from sin rather than to commit sin he ran away most people would consider you as a 
coward because you're running out. Oh, you're running away from a female. Oh, you're running away from a male. What's wrong with you? It's nothing wrong with running away from being tempted by sin. There's nothing wrong with running away or removing yourself out of a fornication or sinful situation. It's better to live holy than to burn. Yeah. yeah. And, and see, that's how the enemy plays on your, um, you could say it's a mind thing because it's a, a carnal thought. It goes, you know, like say a, um, a man and a woman have a sexual encounter and then it's the woman that's being aggressive, you know, and, and the man is trying to do the right thing. And that's why it's important, too, I feel that we should see each other's first sisters and brothers in Christ because we should not want to cause our brother or our sister to fall or to fall into these temptations. So, but the enemy has it like when the one is maybe trying, especially a woman up on a man will say to him, oh, you're a coward, or oh, well, what's wrong? And the mind can automatically go to, well, this person must have a problem, you know? Um, just really, and all these carnal thoughts, and all these carnal thoughts that one is having, understand that, you have to take the word of God, that word of God, and wash those thoughts. You know, wash those thoughts. Because the enemy, he wants to deceive us. He wants us to think that it's just a simple thing. But when the Bible talks about the bed being undefiled, that means that there is a sacred place there. There's sacred things that sacred. And understanding that marriage is a replica, or just like you said, so it is in, on he in heaven, so it is on earth. So marriage is a replica of heaven, meaning the mother, the father, and the son. So just like our relationship with God, we do not commit adultery with God by putting other gods before us. So these things are very important. And could you go ahead and explain to uh, explain the what God means by the dead being undefiled. Well, let's talk about the dead being undefiled. Um, the Bible says that a man leaves his mother and father and clings unto his wife, that two become one flesh. I'm going to use it to make my point. It means that the fact that we should not have no business defiling a a sacred, we can consider our, our, our bed a sacred place because it was meant for only times for two people, for them people to be in the bed is when they're becoming one flesh. Not two people still two flesh and not becoming one. Because it also says in the word too, it's best to marry than to burn. So if you're willing to take a risk to burn in in hell because you wanted to please your flesh and if you wanted to still be just two fleshes and not one then you really defiling the bed you're really really defiling the bed because of the fact that God treats the bed as a sacred place yes. as a place that he considers holy and well, pretty much he was, when he told even Moses this, that when he told him to take his shoes off, because he was walking on holy grounds, even though he was in the bush, he was in the bush, but he never got consumed by the fire. So if you want to be consumed by fire, it's best to become one flesh, it's best to be married than to defile the bed and defile yourself, your temple, because of your you wanted to ple have a flesh pleasing moment. Exactly. And those moments can turn into hours and days and years. And what I mean by that is because there is a bond that happens when someone commits um, or go into fornication together. And then from that, a lot of relationships have been built on fornication itself. Because either they enjoyed that supernal placement and felt that they were building something on that, not understanding that you are drawing into a relationship, not by the principles of God. 
And and then a lot of those, that's why we have a lot of divorce, because why? why? Because we're starting these relationships, not getting an answer from God, is this the person for me? And what I really love is when you see Yeshaya cries at the well, and the Samaritan woman came and he asked her for drink. And, you know, it's like, why would she, he ask her for drink? But the beautiful thing about that story is to understand that he said, talked about her husband. She said, well, I have none. He said, well, you have five, and the one you're with is not your own. And understanding, so that means he had to be in five different relationships, five fornicating relationships, or whether she was married to them or not, or what she thought. Now, the way he said it, the one you're with is not your own, meaning that that's not even your husband. And that's why I, I God showed me that God has not stopped bringing his son, his daughter that he loves to bring, that he has for that specific man. God has not stopped bringing. That's what he did in the garden. He brought Eve to Adam. Why? Because he saw that Adam... Adam had found favor with God because he was working and doing the things of God and he was obedient to God. So God brought him a woman. Now there's a lot of relationships um, that have gone through divorce. And of course, I'm going to speak a lot about that in the next mashed potatoes, all about relationship, the D word, because a lot of people don't understand divorce and some things are shunned off about divorce, but not understanding that even when God, God himself will divorce his people unless they do what? Unless they obey and do the works of God. So then you have a lot of relationships that have gone separate ways. He said at the end time, that what's going to happen? That daughters was going to rise against their mothers. Sons against the fathers, husband and wives. Why? Because we're talking about wheat and tares right here. So the most important thing is understanding that the most important relationship on this earth, on earth, is the husband and the wife. Why? Because it's a representation, same as our relationship with God. That's why it shows the bride and the bridegroom. And so... When we sleep with others and bring them into our bed, we are putting other gods before, we're putting other men before our husband. You know, we're committing adultery. We're coming out of this committed relationship. So what would you say, you know, knowing that you have these committed relationships, what would you say to those who have divorced? How do they can see it and know how it's lined up with the word of God? or not lined up with the Word of God? Particularly when it comes down to being the worst. I'm going to use my scenario as a, as a point, to make a point come across. As me going through a divorce, and it also in the stage that things don't work out, it leaves you kind of open in a situation that you know you're being divorced from that husband or being divorced from that wife while you're going through it it still can leave you in a vulnerable situation because your your flesh begins to crave to fornicate commit adultery because now that you're going through the divorce and you're not getting nothing from being intimate with you as a man to, to your wife or to your husband, you're going to wind up trying to please that, take, trying to find where it can to please that craving. But often the world is telling us to cast down imagination. That means we need to start going through the because the devil, the mind is the devil's first shot, and he could put trying to put the things of imagination to go through our minds, uh, fornicating, committing adultery. That could prove that it's committing adultery because 
was to marry. Even so, even to that point, we're getting ready to go for that force to be finally settled. We're still open and still got our guard up and still trying to protect ourselves at the same time for what we've been through and not for us to be going back into disobedience because of the situation that was presented before us. Right. Right. And when you think about that, too, because, you know, a lot of the churches go on about um, divorce, and that's why I really wanted to talk about the bit on defiance and understanding that, you know, there are a few things in the Bible that um, cause that gives you um, freedom um, in marriage, um, and um, if you have a divorce, one if the unbelieving husband let him leave, or if the unbelieving wife leave, let her leave, and that they're no longer caught onto bondage. That's fun. Um, and then understanding what it means for that person to leave, you know, and, and it's some things that you need to read in scripture to understand these things. What does it? actually mean for an unbelieving husband to leave or an unbelieving wife to leave. Because understanding, when you look at Samson, and every child of God that has a position to do a work in God, when you have a position in the work of God, a lot of times people are putting your life to pull you or steal the power that God has given you for your purpose. And that's when you look at the Delilah spirit. You know, and then you can look at the woman at the well, how she was at that well. And even the one that she was with, the man that she was with was not her own. It makes you think, well, whose man was she? If it's not her man and she's with that person, you see. So that's why it's so important for us to understand that when people are being getting a divorce, like you have that experience, myself have had that experience. And then understanding, well, what does this really mean? You know, um, because a lot say, well, when you get a divorce and then you get married again, that's adultery, you know. But then, you know, some say, well, no, it's not. But really, what is it? Is it that you, if God frees you from it, like a widow, if someone dies, you can get married again. If that person leaves, he's saying you're no longer under the law, which is a bond to that. You see what I'm saying? So that's why you can't point to someone's situation and say, well, that's this and that's that. Because you never know what God is doing in that situation. But what's most important is that we follow God's direction and not do those things that are not told to us, told for us to do through the power and the love of God. So I wanted to actually go to a couple of scriptures. Um, to about the word um, undefiled, um, understanding the what that means in in your life or when you're getting married because it's a very sacred thing because when you think of that, why did God allow man and woman to consummate in the first place? Because consummation, which is the making love or the two becoming one, was really what joined the marriage together. Was the con- is the consummation, and what did God create consummation or for the woman and man to come together for was to be fruitful and to multiply. That was the main reason for the bringing together of the man and the woman. And now you got this lustful sector that's going all over the place, and and many comes from <laughs> the real root of what it was here for. What is it here for? And, and many indulge into it, and they want to have abortion, you know. But wasn't that the reason why God put men and women together, you know, to be fruitful and multiply? We're forgetting what God has actually put or given us for these things to do. So how do we come to the place where we got to get back to the root? We have to get back to the root. And understand that we have to apply the word of God to our lives 
in order for it to uh, manifest righteousness. Hmm. Um, I was going to go. Go ahead if you have something to say because I, I see Chris. Oh, I was waiting for your scriptures. Um, I was waiting for your script. I was waiting for your scriptures okay. that you were going to say, and I was going to throw something in there too. Okay, okay. Let let me pull that up. I had got sidetracked there. Um, let me find it here. Okay, here we go. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So just saying, you know, marriage is honorable. That's, you know, that's when the two become one, you know, and understanding yep. that's the same thing with us and God. When mm. we marry God, we become one. That's why... Even in the marriage, it's like our bodies is the temple of God. Our bodies are the temple of God. So when I get married to someone, God reigns in both of our temples as one together. That's why the adultery um, and fornication and all that is because now I'm one with this person. I am When I see this person, I see myself. How I do this person, I do mm -hmm. myself. That's why Christ said to love her like Christ loved the church and died for it, you know. But then you do have situations where, like, when I've got to divorce myself, knowing that did I make that decision to marry this person and God allowed me to versus me waiting for him to bring me to my husband. So, therefore, I can be in a relationship Liken unto the woman at the well. That he says, well, the one you're with is not even the one for you because that's the one, not the one that I brought to you. And understanding from my, from my lesson and what God showed me is that marriage is about purpose. Marriage is about vision. Marriage is about serving God mm -hmm. together. And that's why he said, be equally yoked. Be equally yoked. You see, not allowing anything except the word of God to be your guide to see if this is the man that God has put into my life to be the head of my household. Is he the one to be the head of my household? And I should know him and know the enemy's voice because <laughs> Eve made it very clear. She, she actually gave in a way for us women as instructions to understand when we are being deceived. And a lot of us have been deceived by the things that have come out of man's mouth because why? Because maybe we was lonely. Maybe he, we think he looks good or maybe we think we can change him. But it, none of that, we shouldn't even have to think of those things. Or her, you know. We shouldn't even mm -hmm. have to think of those things. Because if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm moved by God and God said this is him right here, it don't matter about any of those things because I know that he is the one that God sent to me, and that that's what makes it that's what makes it right. But go ahead, you have the verse too as well. Um, because one of the things that comes with even committing this fornication is like one of was coming out of Leviticus chapter twenty, verse ten through twenty one. I'm gonna give you. I don't want to go into it because it's a lot to read, but. This well, he's coming out of Leviticus chapter twenty, verse ten through twenty-one. It's talking about the list of constant of commands against sexual sins includes extreme, extremely harsh punishments, and God had no tolerance for such acts for the following reasons: one, they shatter the mutual commitment of married partners. Two, they destroy the sanctity of the family. Three, the, mm -hmm. they twist people's mental well-being. And four, they spread disease. Sexual, sexual sin has always been widely available, available, but the glorification of sex between people who are not married to, e to each 
other often hides deeper tragedy and hurt behind the scenes. When we, when society portrays sexual sin as attractive, it is easy to forget the dark side. And that's what a lot of people do. They forget there's a dark, twisted side of committing fornication. And when Leviticus it was talking about that because God had no tolerance of people committing fornication, especially back then in the, talking about it in the Old Testament because there was harsh punishments and God didn't play like that mm-hmm. back then. Mm-hmm. And what people don't also realize that when it comes down to doing anything that's that, but going doing anything like that, it's God has had good reason for prohibiting fornication we might as well say sexual sin. He he, he loves us and wants the the very best for us. And what you're talking about being equally yoked, having that particular husband, having that particular wife that's meant for us, but a lot of times we run into, how should we say it, wolves in sheep's clothing. Well, I'm going to change it to saying it like this. We run into men and women in holy clothes, meaning that they present themselves holy, but when you go deep enough into them and to that point, you really see them because they take off the clothing bit by bit to show who they really are. And we end up, and a lot of times we fall for that sexual mm-hmm. temptation and that sexual sin, that fornication or that commit adultery because we saw something holy, but we never really one acknowledge God about the situation two gave them to God and three we didn't take time to get to really really know them because it says in the Bible test the spirit by the spirit am I correct that's correct so how you will know that they're really a child of God if you don't test them by the spirit if Cause some of us, we ain't going to know it all when it comes down to it, but we should know enough from right from wrong and what the, it says in the word of God. But the only ones who are more open and more vulnerable to the type of situation is the babes in Christ. Because when I say the babes in Christ, meaning there are people who I, I kind of taught on this part about it yesterday at Sunday school at my church. They're on a teeter-totter. Once I have the world, once that size has God. One has living for the devil, one has living for God. And as us, as men and women of God, we should be encouraged people to go to the right direction and not doing it to a point that we're leading and we're pushing the people, especially these babes in Christ, back into the world. So it's up to us to be encouragement. It's up to us to teach them and show them the way. And the reason also that Samson lost his strength and was disobedient because he was deceived and lied by Delilah because of the fact that he, she used the word love. Because I know a lot of us read the story of of Samson when he was dealing with Delilah. And I'm going to give you that particular scripture. And that's Judges chapter 6. Verse 15, it says, She said unto him, How canest thou say, I love thee, when thine heart is not with me? See that had I, how she used the word love to get to that mm-hmm. point to get what she wanted and what she needed to hear from Samson? That word love came into play. Just like I taught on a, I taught on a, on a message, I did a heart to heart talk with that when it's talking about if you love me. See, I'm going to go a little more deeper because when we tell use that word love, you can almost get somebody to pretty much get them to pretty much almost do anything you want because you say, if you love me, you'll be it to me, you have sex with me, you do this with me, you do that with me. You, before, you get what, get the mm. point where I'm, talk, where I'm going with that? Because we're using love. So let me continue. Let me finish this scripture because mm-hmm. I know you got something to say too. Has, thou has mocked me these three times and have and has not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. So pretty much in that scripture, Delilah used the word love to Samson was deceived because he wanted to believe Delilah's lies. 
And a lot of times we believe people lie. That's how a lot of times we get caught fornicating. That's how we get caught shacking up. That's how we get caught committing adultery. Because that word alone can be used for good or evil. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, it's also was talking about, because the reason is, because although he could strangle a lion, he could not smother his burning lust and see the light of mm-hmm. for who she really was. That's the couldn't see the light of for who she really was. That's how we get mm-hmm. caught. That's how we trip up. Mm-hmm. Yes, and and in that piece, I love that because when you think of Delilah, I mean, Samson really loved her, you know, and and that's what happens when you think. Now, this is really deep. When you really think about it, a lot of relationships, it seems like a lot of times that there's one in there that's just loving more than the other. It seems like one goes in with the right intent, with the love, and the other one can have cruel intentions like Delilah. And that's why it's important for us in the entity stages to see what God is saying, you know, because a lot of us, because we are moved by our own temptations, whether, oh, this person has to be laughing, I really enjoy this person, uh, I'm just having a grand time, you know, and then these little things come up, but you, now, if you bonded, um, have committed fornication, now you don't understand the stronghold and the, the bond that is there that actually can alter the way you're thinking because of the soul ties that you having. And naturally you know that this person really is not right for you, you know, but then the mind goes, well, he can change or she can change or we can work on this. You know what I'm saying? And then you're still trying to make it work until 13 years, 10 years, seven years down the road, you realize I can't do this anymore. Because why? Because you rooted and grounded that relationship not in God. It didn't start there. Not to say that all marriages can be like that because there can be a transformation. There can be a change because you look at Hosea um, and him marrying the whore, you know. And then again, then you have that story that they were together and how that worked. And then you have the story of the woman at the well that she had five and the one she had was not her own. And that's why even when I coach people, I, I'm not to say of a person to, to get married, to choose to marry that person um, or to divorce a person because that is something that that person and their relationship with God has to come into effect. And like you said, love, love is important. So many people are getting married for so many other reasons rather than love. And then, then you people on the outside, we don't understand. Well, what's going on with this? What's this situation? And that's why God said, don't judge, because you don't even know what's going on in that household. You don't know what um, they started and built that relationship on, you know, and, and how God will pull many out of relationships because of his purpose and position that he has on his call to do a work. And that's why I say that even really boldly because of the woman at the well. And, and when God gave me revelation that God has not stopped bringing the, the man, his wife, God has not stopped bringing the man, his wife, the king, the one that is doing the work of God. And also, he's not stopped, you know, blessing, you know, the, the wife, because everyone is not a wife. Everyone is not a helpmate, you know, and that's why it's important for us in the infancy stages to make sure we got the root down right. You know, you, you, want, you plant a tree, you know, you, the trunk of the tree is where the nutrition is, where all the, the ground, where the root is. And the root we should all have in anything that we pursue and desire to have, it should be the root of the Word of God. The Word of God should be the reason why we, we know that this person is right for me. Because I love, like, what my sister said, me and her was having a conversation. 
She said, you know, these little things, you know, women think about, well, all his socks is under the bed and all he don't put his, you know, shoes up. She, if you think about those little things, then you're not even looking at the spiritual things. I think we as women need to bypass the thing of the small things and start looking at the big picture. You know, is this man a king? How is his relationship? Not so being so petty, like she said, being petty to think about him hurting my feelings, but how about this man? How does he feel when he doesn't do what God expects from him? Does he feel like, oh, I don't want to hurt God's feelings. I want to please God. Is he a righteous man? You know, is he doing righteous things? And not only allowing him to make you laugh and to go through these things with him and having fun and going to the movies and in your wee-wee moment, but how does this man deal with life? How does he act when he's angry? Or how does he act or how does he, you know, do things when he pressed up against the wall? Two walls. And what, what, what kind of man is he? You understand? So these are the qualities what we need to be looking in a mate. You know, if that significant one that God has for us. You know, so that when we don't get caught up in temptation, get to know a person's spirit. Try the spirit by the spirit. Understand what's there. Because trust me, all the outside and all the looks and all that, I'm going to tell you, if a person is the hell in your life, what they say, sleeping with the enemy, if you got the enemy in your bed, I don't care how cute, how sexy, what six pack, what, what you have, eventually that person is going to get so ugly, so ugly, because what? They are there to take what? Your power, your position, the will of God that's in you. And God's not going to allow that. God is not going to allow that. And that's why like, you can't choose to say, like, myself being divorced, you being divorced, understanding that people are like, well, oh, my God, you know, divorce is, you can't, you can't do divorce. You know, and not understanding the Bible has places in there about divorce. God does bring out his people in situations from divorce. But the most important thing is that you are directed by God um, in that situation. And that's why I'm, I'm very excited about Mashed Potatoes and the next um, series that's going to come out about the D word. Because the D word is not only something that, happening among um, husband and wife across the world, but also with our relationship with God. We have divorced God as a people. We have divorced God as a people. And as he has put this in my heart to share, to understand the power Mm -hmm. of what that word divorce is, when you divorce God, you have married death. When you divorce God, you have married death. So it's very important for us to know, even in the infancy stages, about who that we sleep with or choose to be our husband or our wife through God. Go ahead. You have something to say? (laughs) I was so deep in listening to what you were talking about. It wasn't even funny. But... And you're absolutely right, because a lot of times in our lives, we end up with the person that we wasn't supposed to be with, and at the same time, you was also right. We, uh, we as people divorce God a lot of times when we have who we want. Mm-hmm. We divorce God. And while I, was taught, while I was teaching Sunday school, I was teaching my loyalty, and when it comes down to it, a lot of us have been so quick to take our loyalty to somewhere else once that purpose with that one person is fulfilled. And how easily we can just pick up and take our loyalty and go somewhere else with it and place it there until mm-hmm. that purpose is fulfilled and we take it and go back somewhere else. And that's what we're doing with God. We want to give him our loyalty when we need something from him. If we need this, we need this, we need this. Oh, we we down a hundred percent. We lower to a hundred percent until that's the until moment. 
until we get what we want. But also in the word of God, I'm going to use to how not only we can have adulterous men, women, but there's also adulterous men and seductive men. And I'm coming out of Proverbs chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, to the little dying, be from the strange women, even from the even from strangers which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and mm-hmm. forsaketh the covenant of her God. And adulteress is adulterous woman is a seductive or a prostitute. Two of the most difficult sins to resist are pride and sexual immorality. Both are seductive. Pride says, I deserve it. Sexual desire. I need it. In combination, the appeal is deadly. In fact, says Solomon, only by relying on God's strength can we overcome them. Pride appeals to the empty hand empty head, sexual enticement to the empty heart. By looking to God, we can fill our heads and fill his head, fill our heads with wisdom, his wisdom and our hearts with his love. Don't be fooled. Remember what God says about who you are and what you were meant to be. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we be involved with these men or these women that's placed in our lives. And sometimes we get to a point we forget who brought that lover in our lives, who brought them in in the first place. And when mm-hmm. we forget, when we sit there and forget about who brought them there in the first place, we wind up being so wrapped up. If you even get to a point that God would literally yank that person away because we took the time to forget who put them there in the first place. We take, we put more God. We start, we start, we worshiping that person that God placed in our lives. And we forget to worship God. We worship the person that's placed in our lives. And God is a jealous God and we should not have no other God before him. Yeah. But a lot of times our empty heads and our hearts, because a lot of times we commit fornication, mm-hmm. commit adultery because a lot of times we are empty in our hearts and we're empty in our minds because of the fact we're a lot of us be so lonely we be so single, we're not in a relationship, we're not married to nobody we're craving a significant other so bad that we're willing to settle for anything to try to so called fill that need Fill that in, in, in our heads mm-hmm. and fill our hearts, but we're not filling our heads with the right things, and we're not involving ourselves with the people, the right people who's going to keep us filled with the right things. Meaning, if they're a woman and a man of God that's placed in our lives and desires to be in our life, they will fill us with what God wants us to be filled with, and that's with more God and not the person. So when we're filling ourselves with the wrong type of people and we filling ourselves up, mm-hmm. we bound to forget who placed them in our lives. We were bound to forget about God. So a lot of times mm-hmm. we have to be careful of that and don't let no man tell you that he can't be no seductive man nor a of, 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 uh, prostitute. Because men can do the same, can do it just as much as a woman. Excuse me for saying it like this, but a lot of times it be men and women that is whole being that is whoring around, prostituting around, trying to be sweet, be with and sleep with every woman they can, they can every woman and every man they can get their hands and get into. That to a point, take the words and what they can do there alone can make you almost forget what you were actually meant to do in the first place. And get so addictive mm-hmm. that we forget that we we was placed on this earth for a purpose and not on a purpose to fulfill our fleshly needs. Mm-mm-mm. You know, I want to go ahead to this this right here. Praise God. Second Timothy and the third chapter. 
Mm-hmm. And says, uh, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, confetuous, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And I say this powerfully because we, and I'm talking to my sisters out there, it's so important for us to understand there's a lot of men out there that can have a form of godliness. You know, and you're moved by, oh, he's going to church or he's speaking the word of God. And, you know, he might be a pastor or a preacher or a prophet or just someone who can speak the word, but have that form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And that's what's so important because understand, Satan himself had a form because he spoke the word. He knows the word more than all of us because he was in the heavens. He knows a lot of things about God. He actually uses the word of God to deceive us as he did the same thing to um, Eve in the garden. So he did the same thing with Christ um, when he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. So that's why it's important for us to understand these things that the only the power of God, the word of God, will give us the strength to overcome what? Temptation. And like Eric was saying, when you're so lonely and then you, you seem to just drop because Satan, I love this, Satan thinks he knows you. And, and truly he does because he knows years and years of the things you like. I mean, he's studying you because what he wants to bring is things that's going to tempt you so that you can fall. But instead of us being concerned about him knowing us, we need to say, well, I know you. I know you. And I know your devices. I know know your temptations. I know everything you are because everything you are opposes my father's word. So if you have someone coming up in your life, understand that we are spirit. We have to stop looking at people as the human body. And understand when you're marrying someone or you're, you, you having that person that's coming in your life, you're marrying that person's spirit, the spirit of that person, their experiences, their challenges, how they deal with their challenges, their anger. Are they lovers of themselves? Are they false accusers? What's in there? What is in there? And understanding that the enemy knows that when you're single, You know what I'm saying? He knows what you're waiting for, and he knows that God has something great for you because what? Because you love God and you choose to have God's things. But he will certainly try to tip you and bring you something that's not from God. And God said, the way you can know that is me. My, my, My children know my voice, a stranger's voice they will not follow. So then it goes on to say right here, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lust. You see that? For of this sort are they which creep into houses. Creep into houses of what? Silly women. Why? How how do a woman become silly and not a Proverbs 31 woman? Because if you silly women and you're going into that home, that man is laying you down with what? Laying with sin because he's laying with you and not understanding the power that goes in. Because guess what God says? When a man and woman consummate and they become one spirit, they become one flesh, I mean one flesh, then what you think is happening when sleeping with this person and that person and this person and you think this is my husband and then you realize that it's not and then you know what I'm saying and all these things is happening so God is saying for us and today it is time to get our relationship back with God and get in bed with God first understanding that he is our first husband he is our first love 
He is the first. And when we get back into our intimacy and our faithfulness to God, then what he says, he said, first ask him. Ask him. Ask God, is this what you have for me? Acknowledge me. Acknowledge me in all my ways, in all thy ways, and I shall direct your path. Just because you see something and you like something, because remember that the eyes can deceive you of a pleasure, you know. And the enemy, oh, you're laughing and you're giggling, and, but, but you ain't went through the fire yet. Let's go through the fire together. What's going to happen when we go through the fire? Because relationship, marriage was built to serve God. And if you got one servant and one raised in hell, that's just like water and oil in that house. Now, let me tell you, it's not going to happen. But this is what God showed me through my own situation is that because you love me, Keep standing and doing righteous in me because either that person will transform and join doing the things of God or leave because that's why the Bible said those, the unbelieving, what's the unbelieving? That means that you don't believe in the God that I serve. You don't believe in the word of God. You're not adhering to the word of God, nor are you living in the word of God as I am living. And it can't, because if it's not of God and doesn't understand God, you know, then it's like there's a division in the household. But the beautiful thing about this is God said all things work together for good for those who love the Lord according to his purpose. Because even in my own situation, not only did I become closer to God and understood God more, I would not take that back for nothing in the world. But the beautiful thing is that I've come from glory to glory, strength to strength. And even as me obeying God in my uncomfortable place, when he was done allowing me, (laughs) and I say allowing me because people say, well, you know, it was his permissive will. There's no permissive will with God. It's his will and that's it. That's it. He doesn't give us permission to sin. He doesn't give us permission to do anything outside of the word of God. He said, acknowledge me and I will direct your path. He didn't say, you know, just ask for permission. I'll give it to you. No, acknowledge me and I, I will direct your path. So that's why it's important that we stay in the word of God. So when these, situations come where we're desiring to be in a relationship. All I want to share is understand that relationship that you're having is the same relationship that shows a replica of our relationship with God. And so if you're just reading the studies on this, and this is so important, my sisters, and I talk to my sisters and, and my brothers, is that we don't want to get caught up in all these relationships that either if it's a fornication from fornication for fornication, let me tell you, that's the road to the pit of hell. You have to come. That's why he said, well, you go into a place and your bosom be burnt because if you keep putting yourself in those places, of course you're going to get burnt. You know, it's better to marry than to burn, you know? So understanding that when you are in these relationships, these are some relationships that the God is putting together And there are some relationships that God is pulling apart because at the end of the day, marriage is created for God to do God's work to God's purpose. You got people in marriages fighting over peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. You know what I'm saying? Just getting upset about small things and not really putting their first love in the very root of what it is because that's why God said what I put together, not what God put together, no man could put asunder, not even that man himself. So that's why it's important for us to pray and fast and ask of God and confirm with God and know without a shadow of a doubt 
because he'll do things in you, through you, and for you that man will not even understand because of your faithfulness to God. So if any of you guys have any questions out there, too, for myself or for my brother here, Minister Eric, feel free to ask. Go ahead, Eric. All right, well, pretty much what's going on with that is absolutely right. And a lot of times I know many, I can probably say so many of people, many of us be tired of just being that baby mama, baby daddy, that boyfriend, that girlfriend, that side piece, the sugar mama, sugar daddy. A lot of us have a mindset to being a husband or being a wife. So what I have to say about that part is we need to be, if we seeking love, we need to see the love of God first. Seek ye yes. first the kingdom of God. When we see mm-hmm. God face daily, when we love on God first and love on ourselves, We'll be willing to lo- be able to love somebody else and somebody be able to see that we're loving on God first before we love ourselves, before we love somebody, be able to love somebody else. We cannot love nobody else if we have not even loved ourselves, one. And two, most importantly, we can't be able to love ourselves, love somebody if we haven't, and they don't see us loving on God first. And like I said last week, how do you expect a woman, I'm going to say this to you, how do you expect a woman to be submissive to you if you're not even submissive to God first, when God's not uh-huh. first and your priority in your life? Two, women, how can you expect to be a wife if, her, if, that, if you desire that man to love on you, like it says in the word, why are some to your husband as to Christ? And uh, to the Lord, and also say, as a husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. How do you expect that man to love you and give his life for you if you're not willing to be submissive? If you can't submit to God, why would God give you a husband? And a lot, in large, you probably thinking, like, why are you saying that? It's easy. Some of us, some of y'all, some of us have tendencies to know that. It can't be submissive to God. And if you're not submissive to God, why would I marry somebody who can't be submissive to me? Because yeah. guess what? A lot of women go, go by so much of what goes on in the world that they think because if some of them make more money than a man or whatever, no. It don't matter how much money you make. The, hu- the wife submits unto the husband. The husband is the head of the household. And when you realize that God is the ruler over your life and you willing to submit unto him, then you'll be able to submit unto your husband. That's why a lot of us be in boyfriend, girlfriend and can never go past that point because you're not willing to be submissive and you're not willing to love and give your life as Christ gave his life for the church. God gave his sin son to give his life for us. For us to live, for us to love somebody, for us to love and praise and worship God. If we can't even do the same thing, because it also says in the word that we'll be persecuted, blessed are those who are persecuted. So we're going to get persecuted for doing God's will, no matter what. If Jesus was persecuted mm-hmm. for doing God's mm-hmm. word, that will make us no exception. And what is that scripture I wanted to use? and go into 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3 through 5, and I'm going to use this. Let the husband render unto the wife do the loveless, and likewise unto the wife, unto the husband. The wife has no power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise, also the husband have no power of his own body, but the wife. That part of the scripture that I was talking about that once you are married, once you become one, you have no control of your own body. Your husband has control of your body. And your, you have control of your husband's body. That's part of becoming one flesh. But how can you expect that 
you're not being submissive to that husband, but you want that husband to love and you reuse some of these scriptures on these people. We use the Bible on people. Mm-hmm. Saying, mm-hmm. oh, the Bible says you got to love me as Christ loved the church. But remember, <laughs> I'm not married to you yet. And mm-hmm. people, that's on. what people do who are in relationships, who are engaged, who are engaged. They use the Bible on people. Mm-hmm. Last thing I remember, I'm not married to you yet. So how can that does not come into effect into our marriage to you? So we need to also take time. Stop people, men, women, stop using the word of God in wrong situations. Mm-hmm. Stop using the word of God in the wrong situations. Because you cannot tell this man that he got to give his life for you if you're not married to him. You're still two flesh. You're not one flesh yet. Also, I'm going to toss in this one into play. This might be a little unexpected, but you may catch on to why I'm using this scripture. Um, right now. Mark chapter 6, verse 7. Remember in that Bible, that part of in that scripture that Jesus sent his disciples out two by two? Mm-hmm. In that part, it's part and here's the reason... Here's the reason why God sent his, sent his disciples out two by two. One, for they can strengthen and encourage each other. When you are married and when you're in a committed relationship that leads into marriage that has God in the midst of it, you should be there to strengthen and encourage one another. Not put each other down every time a mistake or belittle somebody because somebody makes a mistake. You're supposed to be willing to Strengthen one another. Even though you're becoming a one flesh, but now you're becoming a team. A team. That's how also God uses that as in marriage because God put two people together. Not three, not four. Not these monogamies and pornography type of relationship when you have more than one girlfriend and more than one boyfriend. No, God put two people together because they can it strengthen and encourage each other too. They could str- no two. They could provi- provide comfort and rejection because sometimes there's gonna be people who's gonna reject what you live for, who you serve, who do you be married to, you the, the man you married to, the woman you married to. You're gonna be reject. There's gonna be people that's gonna be in rejection, and you need to be there for each other to comfort each other. Mm-hmm. Why would a man comfort yeah. a woman? Or a woman come for a man from rejection and she just claiming him behind closed doors but out in public, she don't know him. Or he don't know her but claim her behind closed doors. I can understand a relationship, everybody should, should never know what goes on in your relationship. Nobody should never know when y'all are going to argument. That's absolutely true because sometimes you get room and opportunity for the devil to come in and break y'all apart. But God wanted people, it's just how he sent his disciples out two by two. That's what God wanted us to do. Uh, be teaming up together as one flesh, but together one being strengthening and encouraging each other. Is that mm-hmm. strengthening and, uh, strengthen and encouraging each other and providing comfort because there's sometimes, like I said, even your own family, the ones that you're close to in your family, you want to start trying to do damage because they're not going to, there are some people who is not going to accept it, that mm-hmm. you're in a Christian, holy, ho- holy ghost, fear, sanctified, godly marriage. They're not going to accept that. There's going to be some who will, some who won't. But you need to be ready to comfort each other when it gets to that point in life. Even the world may not, may or may not accept it. But you have to be ready to comfort one another. Three, they could give each other discernment and few mistakes will be made. You're also there. You're also with this person to help cover the mistakes that they make. But it could be fewer mistakes made. Yeah. If yeah. you're not willing to yeah. cover Mm-hmm. If you're not willing to cover, thoughts, if you're not willing to cover their thoughts and bear their burden, go ahead now. It, exactly. If you're not willing to do that, what's the point of you wanting to be married to somebody? Mm-hmm. And that's what's why he gave point? us instructions. 
You have to go by these instructions. That's how the marriage works. You know, like you said, submit. How the woman's going to sin, how the man's going to love, there's no, it, how do you want, a man want a woman to submit to him and he's not submit to God, so he's doing all these things, you know, that God is not taught him how to do or showed him how to do. And then you wonder why these relationships don't work. Just like a woman, we are help me. You know, women, we are to help our husband. We are to assist him. If he's building a house, then we can hand him the tools that's necessary to build a house. We are to help him in his journey and his relationship. You understand? Um, being a woman of wisdom. You know, this is our duty. We have duties. A man has his duty. He's the head of that household. He's responsible for his wife. He watches her with the word of God. He has responsibility, accountability with God for that wife. And also, God looks at the wife to help me. Are you doing what I said for you to do in this relationship? And so even before we can get there of doing the instructions, these instructions before we were even into this marriage that God has brought us, the husband and wife together, is the first marriage is our relationship with God in Christ. And if we don't have that locked down, because the man that's coming in your life or the woman's coming in your life and you know you're child of the king, you know that you have kingdom work and kingdom business to do, that you know that by the spirit of God, this person should be a re replica of your father. He said that you will know them by their fruit. And when that time comes, even now while you await and say, Father, keep me, keep me strong. We have to shut down the noise of the world. Shut down the noise of this world. Shut it down with your ears. Shut it down with your eyes so that you can keep your eyes single onto the word of God so you can be directed to make right, the right choices. How? By asking God first. Asking him first. Acknowledging him first so that he will direct our path. And when these signs come, because you know this enemy's voice, and when he's cussing you out and treating you a certain way and light and dis, um, late, disrespecting you and talking to you, all this, then you know that's not of your father. You know that's not of your father. You know, and get into these relationships not because you love that person, because of a situation you know, that you may have, whether it's because of you feel that the sex is good, that's what they call it in the world, or if you get in a relationship for um, someone to help you pay your bills or comfortability. Um, you know, there's so many different ways that people get married and not what? Standing on the food of God and the reason he created marriage from the beginning. And what I say to you today is to understand marriage Marriage is a replica of our marriage with God. Mm -hmm. And that's why he said the two, two, um, he said, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because when you learn that you know God, that you're one with him and your neighbor, there's no separation. And so God is teaching us to, to love him, our first love, and to love our, our neighbor. It's all about love. And he's showing it in the most beautiful union. Marriage is the most beautiful union on this earth, on this earth. And we have made it like a, a joke, you know, with all the things that's going. Because why? Because we didn't go into it righteously. We didn't go into it right. Now we can come to the place where we can learn and understand it. Because God is bringing us to the place where, hey, if you're divorced, God, if you have been through a divorce, understand that that's a death of that relationship. It's a death of a relationship. So, but I say to you today, the most important relationship that you need to get in bed with, and that's your relationship with your heavenly father and get that relationship right with him. And he will direct you. He will direct you and bring you to that 
righteous person and realize that women, we were busy doing the work for God. Men, you were busy doing the work for God. And God found favor. God found favor on Ruth and gave her her Boaz. God finds favor. And he will bring you to it. All you have to do is have faith and be faithful to him. So thank you, Eric. It has been so real, so beautiful to really do this three-day fix with you on It's All About Sex and being able to hit so many different areas about it and understanding that this has been the downfall and this is a great downfall throughout every nation that can take us straight to the pit of hell. And so it's time for us to stand upright in God and make a true decision and ask God to direct us so that we can be in the right relationship, not for ourselves, but before, but because of our love for God and that the most important thing in any relationship is that we show the love of God. We work and we serve together. We, we heal people in the love of God together with his love throughout nations. This is what relationships are here for. And nothing, nothing more than that than to serve God. Again, thank you all. Thank you all for rocking with Zion here on Rock Life Live. And I so appreciate you. I know every Monday, same place, same time. I am here, Positive Power Radio with Jerry Royce doing it. And I just want to thank you. And I love you. And remember, if you have any questions, go ahead. You can contact us at rocklifenetwork at gmail.com. Or you can call us at 424 354 Six, two, and join us. Of course, you know I have the House of Swords. Come over there. Visit me on the House of Swords. Um, I'd love to see you over there. And We're going to have our very own Dr. Martin Smith over there this Thursday coming at Thursday, I'm sorry, at 8 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time and 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Look forward to seeing you there. Love you all. Um, thank you for rocking with me. You are listening to Jerry Royce Live Worldwide Podcast. Rock with Zion. A rock life. Life. It's a love thing.